And Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the many blessings you've given to each of us. We thank you for your many blessings, but we also know there are many people out there who are suffering at this time. You know, there are people out there in Puerto Rico and people still in Houston and Florida and many, many parts of now in, in, in New Orleans and other places that are suffering from the hurricane damages that are taking place even now and have taken place in the past. I pray that you would strengthen them and undergird them in this time. That you lift them up that they might touch the face of God and know your presence. Be with us now and keep us today and this day that you would lift us up likewise and that we too might be able to touch the face of God. Be with us and protect us, we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. <laughs> they do a little of both, I guess, yeah. Let's see what those will be doing. Having done the invocation already, we're ready to do a doxology. Let's all, let's all see, stand and we sing the doxology. Praise God with all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures, heaven Praise him, above ye heavenly host. Praise all the Son and Holy Ghost. Amen. I'm going to ask Bishop Reverend there to recite the Ecumenical Church Mission Statement as we speak along. Now, Lord, we do pray that you'll be with the leadership of this church. We pray that you'll be with, with Brother Redford as he has spoken and led us here in this, in this, in this statement. We you would pray that you'll be also with each of those who participate in this worship service this day and be with all those who have participated and will participate in worship service throughout the world, that you would lead God and direct them to do thy will. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you come to some of our scripture readings at this time. We, uh, I'll be preaching from Exodus, 
I invite uh, uh, Sister Luella Redfern, if she would come forward and read the psalm text. I'll be reading Psalms 19 from the King James Version. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmaments show in his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voices is not heard. But their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set and a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of the chambers and rejoice. And rejoice like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from the end of heaven, and its it, his um, and its circus to the other end. And there is nothing hidden from the heat, from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the souls. The testimony of the Lord is is sure, making wise the simple. The, stat the status of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgment of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold. Yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can understand his arrows? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep me, your servant, also from presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. I'd ask the bro 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 our brother Bishop to come down and read now the Philippian text. A reading from Paul's letter to the Philippians, the third chapter, verses 4 through 14. And I will be reading from the New King James Version of our Holy Bible. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is of in the law, blameless. For what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. If by any means I may attain the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already attained, or am I already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. 
Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. A reading from Paul's letter to the Philippians. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now it is my pleasure to read from the, the Gospel of Matthew. Reading from the, again from the New King James Version. Chapter 21, verses 33 through 46. Let us stand. Hear another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. And he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now, when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Again, he sent another, other servants, more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when his vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out, out, out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to these vine dressers? They said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits of their season. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on the stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls it will grind him to powder. Now when the chief priest and the Pharisees heard his parable, they perceived that he was speaking of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. We'll come now to a time of offering. And as, that, as the offering now is brought forward, we'll have the singing, 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 playing another dear song entitled Swing Low, Sweet Cherry.
Heavenly Father, we pray that you will bless now this offering and give the givers as well. We pray that you'll bless and keep all of us when, to do thy power and to do thy will in this kingdom and this place. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for your sake. Amen. There's more. Yeah. See, these guys have been to church too. <laughs> Might even be a couple of Baptists and there are some Unitarians in here, you know. Our sermon today is entitled it The Command of Life. But I could have called it the God of life because in many respects, I think in, I think in a way the Ten Commandments gets a bad rap. I say that because most likely it gets a bad rap because of the first couple of words that begin with most, most of the words in, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, uh, Old Testament. Thou shalt not. The interesting thing about that is, uh, as it is in most cases with what most of Scripture we have in our Bibles, a great deal of words added into it. Uh, in many situations, there there are, there are uh, individual writers and interpreters of, 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 the, of the New Testament text, like Tyndale when he wrote his first New Testament, had his own particular flavor to a, to a, uh, to have written the first New Testament. This is the New Testament that predated the King James version. When the King James Version was written, they largely copied all that was in the Tyndale version, but they went back and changed slightly, like changed them there, that it might be more acceptable to the king. And Tyndale was much of a much of a revolutionary, so he changed things about it that made, made, it, made it sound better from his perspective. Now, where does he where does he get this from? You think, well, he should be able to uh, just interpret scripture like it is. It's right there, but even that scripture was a was a copy, of co a copy of a copy. Many of those had changed. We often talk about the inerrancy of Scripture, but we believe in the inerrancy of Scripture of the original languages. The original languages are what, what was originally given over to Paul, to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and the writing of the Gospels. Those things are what we believe in. And the Old Testament is not, not unlike that as well. Most of what we have in the Old Testament came from a, a text called the Masoretic Text. It's, this, 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 this is a, 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 a Hebrew version of the Old Testament Bible. And so the, the, the Old Testament Bible, it's where we get the thou shalt nots in this Bible. So what I'm pointing out here in a many respects sense is that the, uh, the reason we have the thou shalt nots, which make it give the Ten Commandments a kind of a bad rap, is because of what other people put into it. You know, I remember that, that, that movie. How many of you ever watched the Ten Commandments, the movie? Oh, I mean, it's been seen about at least... I think it comes on television about, about it, every year about, about Christmas time sometimes. Right? I always have that. And I, I always, always remember that time in which Moses come, coming down from, the, from Mount, Mount Sinai and the, the people are going wild with riotous living and that sort of thing. And he ha has, the, has, the, has the scrolls alongside here. And when I always look at those scrolls, it has very few letters on there. And uh, th I can imagine if you translated that, it probably would say, no killing. No adultery, no stealing, and we have essentially added something to it to give it give it information. That's just like when used to be certain of the of the of the, of the translations of the Bible, where you would have words in italics, and that was an indication that the that the, the, the original text didn't have it, but we had to give you some more words in here so you could be able to understand it. Uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, the amplified Bibles use a lot more extra words so you can better understand it. So some of the modern translations, the Living Bible itself, in fact, originally was a paraphrase. It was not really a translation. The current Living Bible is a translation, so it's much more accurate. But that, that, those are situations where Bibles have been made, so make it more understanding. Now, we read from the New King James Bible. Uh, th th this was a, a biblical text I got one time and gave to children when I was teaching them how to do sword drills. How many of you know, know what a sword drill is? Okay, a few people know what a sword drill is. You, you take a Bible and hold it along the side here, and, and someone, someone would get, give you a text like John 3.16. You say, and you say, present swords, and then charge. You would flip down there and try to find John 3.16, put your finger on it, and step forward. That was how, how we played the sword drill. Uh, I taught a lot of kids in churches 
the first time how to find their way in the Bible by playing sword drills. Uh, but, uh, but, but it was important for them to get, get that right text in a certain way. And so it, it's important for us to get the text right in many respects as well. Now, I preached a sermon on the Ten Commandments one time. In fact, I preached seven sermons on the, on the, on this, uh, on the Ten Commandments. So this, I could be here for, you know, for weeks and weeks and weeks if I, did, if I repeated what was going on there. But I think we, 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 can, we can break it down a little quicker than that. Because the, the, the Ten Commandments are not so much commandments, I believe, but a guide for life. Yeah. It's a guide for life. It, it, in, in it, it teaches us very much how we should treat God. In fact, three whole commandments deal with treating God. Reading from the NR, NRSV, it says, Then God spoke these words, I am the Lord our God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. And certainly in our way, way of thinking, we have all kinds of gods. People, people always talk about, uh, I remember there was a commercial on television talking about people still stuck with cable when they should be with dish. And, uh, and I, think, well, I think to myself, who cares? I mean, I've got it, I got it coming in off the air. I get it for free. So I, I, but I, the TV set doesn't stay on that long. But some people, for them, the, their television is their God. Yeah. Uh, the movies they watch are their gods. Yeah. Uh, their, their music is, oh, well, I shouldn't say that, but, uh, but uh, some of their music is their God. Uh, the things that you put before God is your idol. Yeah. And you should have no other God before you. That's what God is telling us. We should put those things first. That comes up in his second commandment. You shall make no self and no idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on earth beneath or that is in the water underneath the earth. Uh, you shall have nothing before God. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the Shema that, that, that the Hebrews would say is, Says the Lord is one God. That's it. God is God. Uh, there was an old joke about, you know, wh where does the bear sit? Uh, and the answer is anywhere he wants to. <laughs> and when, again, we're think, thinking about uh, the Ten Commandments, when, when Moses sees that burning bush and thinks that's really strange, and, and Joshua says, you know, you'll burn a bush that burns, so what this? Yeah, it burns, but it doesn't get burned up. It just keeps on burning. So Moses takes off to go check on this. And he goes up and talks to God, and God says, I want you to do a great thing for me. I want you to go back and get your people out of Egypt for me. And, and Moses turns to him and says, now, but, but when I come there, they're going to ask me, who sent me? Who shall I say has sent me, he's asked him. And God said, I am that I am. I am has sent you. That's who God is. He doesn't have to give a name for himself. We have people in the world who believe God is Allah. Well, okay, that's close enough. Uh, so there, there, there are many, many uh, 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 names in the Bible for God. There's El. Uh, there's Jehovah. There's Yahweh, which, from which Jehovah comes from. Um, we have all kinds of names for God. Elohim, uh, names for God. But God is God. And you have no other God before him. That's pretty simple and straightforward. Then we come to the third one. You shall not make wrong for you the name of Lord your God. For the Lord will not acquire anyone, acquit anyone who misuses the name. I, I'm always, I'm always, when someone says something to you, something like God, it always bothers me. They say, uh, you know, I, I can't remember what they say. Now, it's, it's some common phrase that they used all the time. Uh, I remember one time be, being being in a situation in on the soccer field, and there there there, there, there was a, a parent up there fussing up at me for some some call or other, and he used God's name in vain in the process of it. I stopped the game and told him not not to take my Lord God's name in vain. And I was surprised that all the fans said, yeah, that's right, you stop doing that. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes a referee gets the point from the fans once in a while. Once in a while. Not often, but once in a while. And that, that was one of those times. You, God, God's name should not be taken in vain. God, God is God. So we should respect him with all of our person. 
Jesus was asked the question, what is the great commandment? The great commandment is that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all the heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like unto that, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love is at the center. And we should love our God by showing our respect of God. By not, not having idols of him, worshiping other things. God is God in our life. Putting him center in our life is what will make us have life and have abundance from it. Then the next verse now gets with the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you will labor and do all your work. I remember, you know, we were talking about this once before at a, uh, asking a friend of mine who was, uh, who had just started a new job working at uh, uh, some place where, where they make electrical component parts. And uh, he gets to work Monday through Saturday, six days, gets to work 10 hours. He, he draw in 60 hours. And so he's, he's enjoying all that extra pay. But, he, but, but you can work on Sunday if you volunteer to work on Sunday, but you don't have to. Now, that, 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 that's a company after my own heart. Chick-fil-A doesn't have anything going on right now. You can't find an open Chick-fil-A anywhere in the, na in the nation. And oddly enough, back, back when Soviet Russia was taking place, they actually had a Sabbath too. We think so, so bad about Soviet Russia and all, all their communism, but uh, back when we were abolishing the blue laws, uh, they, 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 they were keeping the Sabbath holy, isn't that something? The Sabbath should be kept holy. There's a time for us to rest and turn our eyes to know more about God. That's why we worship here. That's why we're here now. That's why we, we, we've been, been to worship service perhaps earlier this morning. It's a time to get in with God. Time to t take a moment, at least one day out of the year, one day out of the week, one day, one-seventh of the time we sit on this earth and spend some time thinking about God. And then we come to a whole series of various state statements. One of them has to do with parents. Honor thy father and thy mother. So that days may be long upon the land the Lord your God is giving you. Now, one of the, one of the things that uh, is kind of troubling about that, when we say honor thy father and thy mother, we think that it means do what they tell you to do. <laughs> and I think of those parents out there say, yeah, that's what it means. That's right. they got to do what I tell them to do. And that's one thing, perhaps. But back in Moses' time, they practiced geriatricide. Geriatricide is for the old folks to take an out and left on the side of the road to finish their, their life and just, just die. I remember there was, a, there was a western sometime. I can't remember what the name of the western was. But it had a scene in there where somebody found an old Indian uh, sitting in a cave. He was just sitting there half naked, sitting in front of a little fire, and he wasn't doing anything. And it turned out the old man was just being told to go in that cave and die. That's what they did with old folks. I don't know what tribe that was. I'm not laying aspersions on Indians, but that was the story. And th this, in this story, this person uh, picked the old Indian up, put him on the horse, and carried him into town and tried to take care of him. In the end, he did get the old man to back, back, back to his tribe. He showed the tribe that he was still of some value. There was a story told one time about, about a family that, that they had, had an old father living with them. And they had, had, had a little boy, too, there. And uh, the, the old father was, was kind of kind of had the palsy, kind of shook a little bit. And so to make sure he didn't break anything, they, 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 they gave him maybe plastic plates and maybe, maybe wooden plates or something like that for him to, in case if he dropped anything, it wouldn't break. I know, they, know the, parents, uh, the parents there thought they were being uh, sensible. This was a practical thing to do. But it was kind of bad in a way. So, when, so the father went away to work and he came back home and he found his boy sitting in the middle of the living room floor whittling away on a piece of wood. He was pissing his piece of, piece of wood flying all over the place. And the, and the father asked him, son, what in the world are you doing? And the boy looked up to dad and said, I, I'm making you a bowl for when you get old. <laughs> <laughs> Children learn, don't they? Children learn very well. So after that, they, they gave, gave the old father regular plates and regular, uh, regular dinnerware like everybody else and started showing him honor in the proper way. And that's what's really meant here. This, this is why there's, that there's a possibility of having your days long upon this earth. 
because you take care of the old folks you call parents. It was my, uh, my thrill, as it were, for me to be able to look after my mother until she died. Um, I was always sorry I wasn't able to be there when she actually died. She was in the hospital at the time. And Mama was always, um, you know, always an independent sort, very independent. And she would have, she would have, oh, man, we'd have fights all the time. She'd say, you, you, you're not doing right. You're not some kind of, what kind of preacher you are. What kind of minister you call yourself doing this, that, and the other. And uh, I'd say, you'll, you'll go out and get some other place to go, that sort of thing. And I would say, well, I'll just move up to my place in, in Winsboro and, uh, and stay up there. And she didn't like that too much. In fact, she didn't like me camping out of there at all. She just hated that. But after she got a stroke and started having her first little TIA, kind of changed her, her perspective. After a while, she realized it wasn't so bad having a son willing to stick around and be with me. And I consider it a privilege and an honor to be able to do that for her, too. She, she had cleaned my behind many a time and spanked it many a time, too, I can tell you. Yeah, <laughs> But mom was with me through thick and thin. It was mama and me. And when she passed from this earth that after the age of 90 years of age, I miss her still. And that's how you honor your parents. That's how you honor your father and your mother. The next one, a whole series of them deal with the thou shalt nots we talked about. Thou shalt not murder, it says in the New, New Revised Standard Version. Uh, what does it say in the uh, New King James? Has anyone read that yet? You shall not murder. You shall not murder. That's the actual and in true interpretation of it. Uh, it's, I think in the King James it says, thou shalt not kill. But we all know that there are times where killing is something you've got to do. Somebody breaks into your house and threatens your family. You have a right in this state to take his life. I hope I never have that situation. But I got a gun. It's more or less loaded as I can get, get the bullet in the chamber in time. But, uh, but I, I'm, I'm there to protect myself in case someone threatens my property. It's within my, within my right to do that. But that's not murder. The fellow that, uh, that, that went to Las Vegas killed off, how many was it, 58? How many? 58, 58 people. Injured a whole lot of people. He had planned that out. He had had time to, to, to figure that out, to, to make, make 12 some semi-automatic rifles into uh, and almost automatic rifles with that kind of bump stock they're talking about putting on it. He had, he, had, he had thought it out. People said he, had, he, had, he had, had, a, had a tape he had used and recorded how that he had planned it precisely to know where the bullets would land to make sure he took out the people. He, he, was, he had planned this all out ahead of time. He spent days gathering up all the weapons and ammunition up into that room up there in the hotel and keeping anyone from asking any foolish questions like, what, do my, what are you doing with all this stuff? He had figured it out. That was a murderer. Thou shalt not murder. And that's what it says we're not supposed to do. We're not given the right to decide the life and death of another except in protection of ourselves. That's what murder is. You should not commit adultery. Um, adultery is, is quite wanton, I think, in our society. It, is, it has to do with as much within marriage as it does within any kind of relationships or friendships. We, we commit adultery sometimes when we say we're friends with somebody else and, and know that that person's not friendly with this other person, we go with that other person. In a way, that's a kind of adultery. We, we endanger the relationship that we have with others. Relationships are very important. Once you develop a relationship with somebody else, you're supposed to maintain that, that connection. Even as you have this connection with God, you're supposed to keep, keep that relationship with God all the time. And we're to be pure in our thinking and our heart to God and to others around us. Adultery is very prevalent in our society. And you shall not steal. Now, this is a very interesting one because on the surface, if you look at that and look at the last commandment, which says thou shalt not covet, you would think that property is very important. It's got two commandments. 
Now, some modern scholarship think that there's something missing from that particular thing about thou shalt not steal. What they think is that what's going on here is it should say thou shalt not take another. During this day and time, kidnapping was also common. They killed, they killed, the, they killed, the, killed the old folks. The Israelites were not all that nice. The Is Israelites had their problems. And they also went out and kidnapped folks. They have, they have no compulsion about that at all. So when, when this one comes through, in a sense, if you look at the commandment, it starts with reverence of God. Three commandments for the reverence of God. And then as it comes down, it comes down into, into more personal things, talking about murder, taking of life, adultery, uh, destroying, of, destroying of, co of covenant relationships. And, and finally, and, and still, finally, taking another one away from, from where they are found. There are places in this world where you know, recently, in, in, remember Nigeria, some of these young girls were hauled away. They were kidnapped and some forced into sexual slavery. That kind of thing is, is, shouldn't be in our day and time, but it is. There have been cases recently of, of a young person that was, was taken when they were a baby. And they were finally returned to their parents. Recently, there was a story about that. People do that. They may do it out of love, somewhat, some kind of version of love or other, a desire to be a mother, a desire, desire to, do, to be, be something extra themselves, to fulfill their needs, but they have no right to take another. And that's what some modern scholars believe is what this meaning is talking about. You shall not take another. Then the next one is, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Dealing with, deal, then we're talking, talking about uh, lying to one another. We're not supposed to be doing that. If, we're having, if we have a good covenant relationship with one another, we will not be lying about one another. If we love God, we will not be lying about other people because they are the part of the creation of God. I remember years ago, there was a, if you look at it, all of it can be, can, be, can be centered around the idea of love. The greatest of these is the, 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 the commandment, the great commandment was to love the Lord to God, heart, heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the, and the second is great, it's just equal to that. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love is the center. The commandments in here are full of, of the idea, just with itemizing it, the idea of that we're supposed to be in love with each other. We're supposed to be in love with God. Love is supposed to be the center of everything. And if you love somebody, you will not, not, be, not be bearing false witness. Uh, I taught a bunch of boys one time in a program called Royal Ambassadors in the Baptist Church. Southern, Southern Baptist Church had it. And, uh, and uh, I, I, know, I knew the reason the boys were there was to play basketball. We, we, basketball was our draw. We got the kids to come in and we could teach them about God and, and, and to witness to them. But... Uh, but our boys were almost all, all almost all of them were black kids, and, uh, and didn't have any experience at all in, in going into Royal Ambassador program. Most of the Royal, Royal Ambassador program kids would learn the pledge, as a Royal Ambassador I'll become a uh, responsible follower of Christ, keep myself. Let's that, see, man, I'm almost forgotten it now. As a as a Royal Ambassador, I, I will become a responsible follower of Christ. I will. You know, I've forgotten the Royal Ambassador Pledge. I am terrible. I am terrible, folks. I forgot it all. But the thing about it is, almost every kid to learn from age, age was six, seven, eight, nine, ten, they would learn that backwards and forwards. When they got up to the basketball court, we all gathered around the center circle, their team on one half, we our team in the other half, and we would cite the pledge. And those little white kids, they just pop that thing up, da 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 no problem at all. Our kids had no trouble with the last one. That, that, that keep myself clean and healthy in mind and body. They, they, they knew that one meant sports. And so they, they knew about that one pretty well. But they didn't know the others. And they felt bad about that. And all these other boys, they were kind of laughing at them. <laughs> Look at that. He's stumbling around, don't know what he's doing. When they got through with their, had their meeting next week, I told them, Look here, boys. There's one thing in there. If you do that one, then you've done all the others. For some reason, it's the second one in the list to have a Christ-like concern for all people. I think that's the most important one of them all. 
That talks about love. That talks about love of all. In regards of race or gender or, or creed, you love everyone. For God so loved the world. John's gospel uses that word world, and he spits it out. Uh, he uses John's gospel written in just perfect Greek. Oh, it's just absolutely perfect. The scholars have been mar marveling about how, how well it organized. It's so well put together. But once in a while, once in a while, he throws out these words in Kone Greek, which is kind of like slang. And he throws it out like, like, the, like the sinners, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the world. For God so loved the world. He just spits it out. But it shows the love of God. He loves even those who do not deserve to be loved, like you and I. But we don't deserve to be loved. We're God's creation. But we're sinners, too. Yet God loves us. Love is what it's all about. And the final one there talks about coveting. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female slave or, or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. It's finally there where it actually does talk about property. Now the word in the Hebrew for covet there, that they trans we translate covet, means more to us, we talk about, uh, I might covet uh, another guy's car. Boy, I'd love to have that car. He's got a Cadillac. My, I have a neighbor actually next door, next across the street, has a Cadillac. I thought again about getting myself a Cadillac. You know, I just, that, that's a nice, that's always been a nice status symbol, you know, have a nice Cadillac. And then I heard maybe, I saw, saw on, the t on e e email, email somewhere about a 2006 BMW. Nice little yellow four-door thing. That thing looks nice. I, I, in my mind, I'm, I'm envious of anyone who has a BMW or a Cadillac. Maybe I'm coveting it. The trouble is, in the Hebrew text, it don't mean just wanting what someone else has got. It also means planning to get it and then going out and getting it. It means stealing it. See, coveting goes way beyond just wanting it. It has a plan. You got the. You want to get. You want to get it. You plan to get it, and you take it. But God says you let the property alone. That person. Property, it means a lot to us. For some of us, without that piece of property, we might not be able to, might be able to live at all. We know people that are, that are so poor that they don't have a place to live. They're on the street. Most of us are fortunate enough to have property and the means to get it. If, I, if the winds were to come and knock down my house, I got insurance. That'll cover that, I think. Um, <laughs> I sure hope so. I've read all the small print. I think it says that, yeah. But there are other people that don't have that. So a little property means a lot to them. And we're supposed to respect another's property. That is also a part of love. Love is the key. Love is what we are to be if we are to truly follow God and do his commandments. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the many blessings you've given to us. We thank you for these commandments, these guidelines. Mm -hmm.